Professor of Geophysics Emeritus at the Institute of Geophysics and Planetary Physics, IGPP, of the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, University of California, San Diego, and Senior Fellow of the San Diego Supercomputer Center. He graduated as a civil engineer from the École des Mines de Paris and as a petroleum engineer from the Institut Français de Pétrole in 1969. He obtained a PhD in 1974 in geophysics from the California Institute of Technology and a doctorate in physical sciences from the Université de Paris Setienne in 1974. He's past chair of the UCSD Division of the University of California Academic Senate and past chair of the UC uh, Senate Committee on Planning and Budget. Dr. B Munster's research interests have involved the determination of the structure of the Earth's interior by imaging the Earth's upper mantle and crust using broadband seismic waves. This research has led him to an involvement in the use of seismic means for verification of nuclear test ban treaties. He has long been interested in global tectonic problems and in the application of space geodetic techniques, including synthetic aperture radar and laser altimetry to study tectonic and volcanic deformations of the Earth's crust by airborne and spaceborne remote sensing. He has held several positions in industry as well. He was the Norberg lecturer at NASA GSFC in 1996 and was elected a fellow of the American Geophysical Union and of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He received the NASA Public Service Medal in 2003. He has served as founding chair of the Earth and Space Science Informatics Focus Group of the American Geophysical Union. Dr. Minster has chaired various National Research Council committees, including the Committee on Geophysical and Environmental Data, and has served on numerous committees related to solid earth geophysics, including the Board on Earth Sciences and Resources and its Committee on Geodesy. He chairs the NRC study on scientific accomplishments of Earth observations from space and the NRC study on precise geodetic infrastructure. He also served on the Earth Science Subcommittee of the NASA Advisory Committee. He was a founding chair and served two terms as chair of Scientific Committee of the World Data Systems, WDS, of the International Council of Science, ICSU. Let's all welcome now Professor Jean-Bernard Minster. <laughs> Well, thank you very much all for coming. Uh, if you think you hear a French accent, uh, this is a new feature in Zoom. You can improve your appearance and you can improve your voice. <laughs> and uh, I take advantage of it, of course. Uh, this is an uh, adaptation of a keynote address that I uh, uh, delivered to a NASA workshop uh, about uh, two and a half years ago. And most of that takes place last century. So uh, I will uh, go immediately to, and I cannot, how come I can't advance this keynote? Okay. And I, I gave once a lecture at the very end of last century at uh, the Ettore Majorana uh, Center in Eritrea. It is a paper uh, organization. So I was going to give the whole talk in Latin, uh, but I thought it was a little bit ambitious. So I give the title in Latin, which you might think is uh, a bit over the top, but a couple of members of the academy told me it was amusing. So I'll use it. But important are the conclusions that I 
I came to uh, in that talk. That was that was two thousand. It's going to be really important in the next millennium to know exactly where we are and to control our position and our speed. And twenty years later, it's pretty clear. Uh, you know, one of the first things that the Russians are trying to do in uh, eastern Ukraine is deny the Ukrainian access to precise geodetic positioning, GPS, and to the drones that they use. So uh, that's something that's evolving, but it's getting better and better. Uh, if you have a cell phone, you have a GPS receiver. If you have a car these days, if it's been made in the last decade, you have a GPS receiver, and uh, you assume that uh, you know where you are. And orders of magnitude improvement happen every decade in navigation and in processing capabilities. So what happens in geophysics? Well, if you look at things on time scales going from a millionth of a second to the age of the Earth, again, just very ambitious, and from a tenth of a millimeter to uh, basically 10 meters in terms of position. These are all the things that you can actually do. You can navigate, you can navigate aircraft, you can land aircraft automatically, you can navigate spacecraft, you can do precision agriculture. Uh, and then uh, with, uh, with longer uh, time scales, you can start looking at what happens in uh, earthquakes, volcanoes, hydrology, and so on and so forth. And of course, the, the, the golden uh, part of money is sea level, sea level change. And sea level change, you have to be able to do things at the level of a millimeter worldwide over time scales of decades in order to be able to say exactly what happens. Well, NASA has been at it for a long time. And I gave a talk uh, again last century uh, on the 50 years of Earth observations from space. And uh, starting with the early history, uh, the first satellite, Sputnik in 1957, Explorer 1 in 1958. Uh, the, uh, uh, JPL and NASA headquarters people of uh, Explorer 1 are shown here. This was a very small satellite. At the same time, it discovered all kinds of things. Uh, the north-south asymmetry of the Earth, the Van Allen belts, you've all heard of the Van Allen belts. And the first pictures, and this is taken from a rocket, not from a satellite, first picture of the Earth uh, including a hurricane, a, a big, a big storm, uh, and all of a sudden, things had changed. After 1960, you couldn't do, you know, sensible meteorology without taking space pictures. And nowadays, even uh, uh, you know, ordinary TV stations will just show you space observations. So in 1970, NASA had a uh, a report from a workshop uh, in Williamstown and uh, published that report saying that uh, what needed to be done is use space observations to improve cryospheric science. That's the, why does that thing advance all by itself? Uh, uh, that's the, uh, uh, the, the, the polar caps, topography of this and surface change Turns out that for a long, long time, it's getting less and less true. The Earth was the place in the solar system where we had one of the worst topographies, and mostly because the topography of the bottom of the ocean is not easy to get. Uh, atmospheric dynamics, mass transport. Turns out that uh, if you have uh, uh, seasonal changes in the climate, that changes the balance of the Earth. And actually, you can see the monsoon in the displacement of the, you know, the, the polar rotation of the Earth. Ocean dynamics, enormous progress since 1990 in ocean dynamics. 
and of course sea level change. So that was 1970. This is what people thought was going to be important. Now in 1979, NASA got a major project started for a little bit less than a million dollars, uh, where they said we have to study the dynamics of the crust of the Earth and understand regional deformation in West America, plate motions, no, plate tectonics was about 10 years old at the time, rotational dynamics of the Earth. Some of those things had been known for nearly a century, but not understood, and uh, global deformations. And I'm going to show you a lot of slides, which are basically taken from overhead uh, slides that um, my friend uh, uh, Ted Flynn left in his office at NASA headquarters in 1989 when he passed away from uh, cancer. And NASA was going to throw that away. I said, no, 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 no. I, I want to save those things. These, these are great overhead uh, devices that uh, I can use in the future. Uh, so I came back from Washington with a bag with about 25 pounds of uh, uh, overhead uh, well, uh, slides that have been you know, collected by NASA for a long time. I'm going to show you a, a lot of them. But this was 1988. And no, 1970 to 1988, with a project started in 1979. Now, in 2002, NASA said, oh, now we need to review Solid Earth and created a working group. What do you want to do? Well, we're going to study earthquakes, we're going to study landslides, we're going to study glaciers and ice sheets, we're going to study volcanoes, we're going to study mantle convection and geomagnetism. This is now 2002. The topics are the same as 1,990. So 30 years. Then 2007, 10 years later, to sell, to, no, for what are we going to do between 2007 and 2017? Well, we want to study forests and vegetation, ice sheet dynamics, earthquakes, changing climate, but again, volcanoes, earthquakes. Is it that we don't do any progress at all? And no, what happened in between? So clearly, programmatic time scales are about 10 years. Well, then, you know, that's about uh, a little bit more than two terms, two presidential terms. Uh, and uh, a, a successful uh, senator can uh, at least uh, be in office for about a decade. So that's basically what happens. You know, people like to plan things on a decadal time scale, and that happens all the time. Yet, if you really look at what happens in science, the time scales are different. Some of you may remember Claire Patterson. Uh, who uh, was at Caltech uh, when I knew him. And he is known to have provided the first accurate age of the Earth. But he's also known for starting something about lead and lead poisoning. He measured the age of the Earth by doing lead, lead, and uranium lead uh, dating. And he discovered that one of the worst problems is lead contamination of these measurements. So he studied that. In 1967, 65, he started uh, arguing that lead poisoning was a real problem uh, worldwide and society-wide. Of course, the Ethel Corporation and actually the National Academy uh, said that, no, this is horse And he pointed out that lead in Greenland snow was a hundredfold in excess of what you'd expect uh, from uh, geology. Human bones had about a thousand times more lead in them than you would normally expect. And if you compare with the human bones of uh, ancient uh, bones, 
And uh, in urban area, children that had 10,000 fold more lead in their body than, uh, than you'd want to expect. In 1978, the NRC uh, had a study. Uh, he wrote the minority report, which is really worth reading, but it's about 30 pages long. And shortly after, well, not shortly after, 10 years later, we started having unleaded gasoline, mandated. We started having unleaded canning soda. And basically from the time when he started uh, arguing for this and the time when regulation basically got out of lead paint, lead cans and lead gasoline, took about 30 years. That's three times longer than the uh, 10 year time scales we were talking about before. Another example is uh, Stan Glantz, who was serving with me uh, on uh, planning and budget committees that you see in the headquarters. No, he's an aerospace engineer and he became a medical researcher. And he started you know, complaining about non-smoker rights. I mean, so many people were smoking with you know, all those meetings were you know, just clogged up with smoke. And uh, he uh, just, just started making measurements and uh, arguing that smoke, smoking was cancer, uh, uh, a source of cancer and so on and so forth. Philip Morris didn't like him and uh, it took until oh, about uh, 2007 uh, for the Department of Justice to win against the uh, tobacco industry, the uh, uh, racketeering charge that uh, uh, basically uh, changed completely the regulation of tobacco in, uh, in the US. That's about 30 years. So, Let's look at the Crystal Dynamic project. From 1979, it lasted until 1988. And what did they do? Well, they started looking at earth ranging techniques. Basically three main uh, techni uh, technologies. One looking at quasars, which are very, very far away, using radio, uh, radio astronomy tools and doing what's called very long baseline interferometry. The other one is to shoot at lasers equipped with the retro reflectors, and especially AGOs, which built specifically for that purpose, and is still up there, is still a satellite for which we have the best uh, orbit. Uh, we know the orbit of LEGIOs to about a millimeter. And the moon, of course. So let me talk a little bit about that. Let's start with sunlight laser ranging. Uh, and these are these old slides I'm talking about. Okay. So let's say that uh, uh, you shoot a very short pulse of light to the moon. And by short pulse, nowadays we're talking about you know, a, a pulse of light, which is a nanosecond, so a billionth of a second. A nanosecond is about a foot long in light propagation. In the early days, they were doing milliseconds. So this was a, no, very, very long. However, if you have a retro reflector on the moon and a good clock, you can measure the time that it takes for that pulse of light to go to the moon, come back. And if you have a telescope to capture it, uh, you can actually uh, measure, compute the distance of that retro reflector of the moon. Tom Murphy at uh, UCSD has been doing that at a much higher level of precision than what I'm talking about. Uh, but it's, it's still something which is uh, very much being developed. So NASA developed mobile laser ranging systems. So this is a mobile system at Ote Mesa, just very close to the Mexican border in South San Diego County. Uh, Mobile means two 18 wheelers. Uh, this is not very mobile. They had a really hard time coming up to that place. 
and this is what they look like. Uh, you, you could move them from one day to another, let alone move them in the next hour. Uh, which is again, I will tell me so. A mobile laser tracking system at the Ote Mountain looked like this. This is a massive thing. This is early 70s. So in 1962, with millisecond pulses, you could range through the moon's surface. 1964, the first time we could range to the beacon B satellite with a precision of distance from the ground to the satellite to one meter, which is about three feet. Then we had the Williamstown workshop saying we need to do better than that. In 1969, Apollo 11, Apollo 11 uh, dropped a uh, store of retro reflectors on the moon. And thereafter, uh, things started you know, progressing in a very systematic way. And I'll talk about the SAFE experiment and I'll talk about the Coulfant workshop in 1988. And 1998, the International Laser Ranging Service uh, was installed. The, this, the time between the first ranging to the moon and the I, um, ILRS is 35 years. Let's talk about very long baseline interferometry. That's called a VLBI. So in VLBI, what you can do is you take the, the radio waves uh, sent by a very distant star, a quasar, a distant galaxy or something like that. And uh, you measure the time at which it arrives at the radio telescope on the ground. Now that requires all kinds of things. Uh, and plus a million corrections having to do with the atmosphere, the Earth's magnetic field, and so on and so on, the ionosphere, and so on and so forth. However, if you look at what happens here, those pulses arrive a little bit earlier here than there. And if you know the speed of light, that gives you the increased distance of that point relative to the quasar compared to this one. Now, if then you look at another quasar, you get maybe they arrive at the same time. If you look at a quasar, which is to the right, this one may get it earlier than that one. So what you need to do there is just make sure that you record the data and you have clocks at both locations, which are synchronized to a very high degree of accuracy. That was very difficult in those days, and they used what's called mazes. Now, you, you've heard lasers, which is light, but mazes is for microwaves. And uh, th these were big things. And those recordings were done on one inch wide tape, 8,500 feet long tapes, spinning at about oh, 100 inches per second. And they used approximately one bit out of every thousand bits recorded in order to actually compute the time difference between the two telescopes. Well, again, they had portable uh, devices. Portable, now this is a portable device from the ARIES project in 1975 at JPL. Uh, you don't put that in your pocket. Uh, and you need an 18-wheeler where full of electronics to deal with. I mean, you did in those days. And they actually deployed those things in Southern California with the uh, 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 instruments at Goldstone, which is in Owens Valley, Pear Blossom, which is in the uh, Mojave Desert, in Malibu, Palos Verdes, and what they wanted to do is find out whether the Los Angeles Basin, if you measured it again, 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 using those baselines, was actually shrinking. And uh, yeah, yeah, you could actually see that more or less with that, uh, with that technology. This is the mobile VLBI system. Again, two 18-wheelers and big antenna 
uh, at Quincy in Northern California. Uh, again, more ball is all in the eyes of the beholder. If you're NASA, this is pretty small, so that's okay. You can move it. Uh, this is, ah, this is important. What you measure from the quasar is the phase center of this giant antenna. The phase center is a place where all those microwaves coming from outer space get focused and recorded and timed. But where is that on the Earth? You need to actually measure the vector between that phase center and one of those brass plates on the ground that the uh, US Geological Survey or National Geodetic Survey or the county may put in there. And that device here is uh, something that allows you to measure a point on that system to a point in the ground. Uh, well, they thought very accurately, but that's the major source of error uh, when you make those measurements. That's 1983, they had made progress. And 1979, this, they were thinking about you no, know, deploying those things all over the world. This is a map of planned deployments. Never happened. It, it turned out to be too expensive. They probably, probably about 50% of those things were occupied at one point or another and then decided to be too expensive. And uh, these were the participating countries, most of them in Europe, some in Canada and United States. China became very interested uh, and uh, uh, actually they have a, a very active uh, study group, which ultimately uh, they used for studying earthquakes in China. That's an important problem. And there's a couple of antennas in Russia. Well, in those days, it was still the Soviet Union. So let's see the distance between Haystack in Massachusetts and Ansala, Sweden. And what you see here is between 1980 and 1985, over five years, that distance is actually, well, it looks like it's increasing. And it's increasing at a rate of approximately 19 millimeters per year, two centimeters per year, a little bit less than an inch. That turned out to be very close to the ge geologically determined rate of expansion of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. So people became very interested in that because if you just had to improve those data, in order to be able to do geology in real time, basically. So the early experiments, 1962, 1965, 67, were mostly done by astronomers. The astronomers wanted to use those multiple radio astronomy devices to map galaxies out there in the outer space. But in order to achieve that, they had to know the baseline between the two radio telescopes. Geodesist says, okay, well, you have a galaxy like this, but if you can get, pick a galaxy that's a very small point, as far as we're concerned, we can compute that baseline. That's what interests us. So that's one case where two completely different disciplines actually could uh, uh, join forces and the National Radio Astronomy Observatory managed in 1967 to just do the first fringes. Then we had the William Stone workshop, remember? Mobile systems, remember? The crustal dynamics project. Oh, we're already uh, oh, almost uh, 10 years before. The first correlator, that's called the Mark III, that was actually running all the time. In 1987, 20 years later, the International Earth Rotation uh, uh, System, or uh, set board system, was created and then we could actually uh, de determine the rotation of the earth, at least for the first time, to better than a millisecond per day. The length of the day was determined to better than a millisecond. And people discovered that it changes every day. In fact, now we know that it changes 
in a matter of hours. And we'll talk about that. 1998, an international VLVI service for geodesy and astrometry was created. That's 35 years. Ah, you, you start seeing a, a pattern here. Let's talk about GPS. You all know about GPS. You all have one if you have a cell phone. This is the first GPS receiver. This thing was about six feet tall. It had two operators in chairs. This is the first time that the GPS signal was recorded and processed on the ground. At the time, there were only two GPS satellites in the in orbit. Well, good. That that was in 1977. 1979 was the Crystal Dynamics project. Well, 1981, two years later, TI, Texas Instrument, offered the first NASTAR navigator. Now, this thing was a marvel. It was really excellent. It came with a fancy antenna and fancy controls, and you could actually record. By that time, we had uh, on the order of uh, five to eight satellites, I think. And in order to do decent geodesy positioning, you need at least four satellites in the sky. Nowadays, we typically do it with you know, 10, 20. Um, anyway, that thing was, oh, yeah, maybe 20 pounds. Uh, you, you could not put it in your pocket the way you put your cell phone in your pocket. Uh, if you wanted to do something in the field, you had to carry a big antenna. You had to carry electronics. You had to carry batteries to just run the thing. It was a major expedition. But at that time, people started already thinking, and that happened in 1990, about places where you just leave those things permanently. Just leave them there, recording, and collect the data using a connection, a radio connection, a wire connection, nowadays the internet. And the first plan for the permanent GPS array in Southern California was to try and make sure that you had one within a hundred kilometer radius. We'll come back to that. In uh, Early 1990s, where are we going with this? And a committee that actually I chaired said, well, we need to have as many as possible around the world in order to take out all kinds of things. We, we told astronomers, if you want to map your galaxies very accurately, uh, you're going to have to take care of plate tectonics. Plates move. Everything moves on the surface of the Earth. There's nothing that is stable. The Earth is rotating, we know that. It's wobbling, we know that. But it also moves because of tectonics. Volcanoes swirl the Earth. Uh, plate tectonics moves continents around. So you have to solve for that at the same time, or you have to get a solution from somebody before you can actually do something really much better uh, in terms of astronomy. So we wanted to have control sites, reference sites, fiducial sites. And we proposed uh, a, a network. And for GPS, the first concept from the Department of Defense was uh, developed in the early 70s, but the first launch was 1976. Uh, actually, in 1979, at the meeting where the uh, Crystal Dynamics projects were started, Pete McDoran of JPL uh, and Chuck Councilman of MIT uh, gave back-to-back -back talks, and no, this was this was just you no know, really a competitive thing, and they were both called to the carpet. By the DOD said no, no, you can't, you can't do that. No, we're we're going to using be using the signals for military purposes and uh, navigating uh, ships and satellites and gaining uh, the ability of uh, soldiers to know where they are in the desert and and 
my door and consumer said, no, you, you don't need, we don't need your signals. We'll just simply listen to the carrier. And the carrier is basically a sine wave. Well, you know, that got classified. And soon after it was declassified because 1979 to 1984, the series system uh, developed at JPL, a micrometer developed by MIT were out. I mean, they were working. So in 1984, a bunch of universities said, oh, no, we need to have that too, because we want to do plate tectonics. We want to study earthquakes and volcanoes. So they created a university, uh, university navigation uh, collaboration between universities. And they bought four of those TI instruments. These were expensive at the time. They were about $200,000. So that was a major uh, subvention by uh, the uh, National Science Foundation to just give universities for those things. And we had to learn how to use it, learn how to collect the data, learn how to process the data, and a lot of research. And uh, nowadays at uh, UCSD, at Scripps in particular, Yehuda Bach and his group uh, are still doing uh, major research to improve the, the quality of these signals. And nowadays we have solutions that come every tenth of a second. In those days, you had to collect data for a whole day and uh, ship the data to some place and process them for several hours and it was complicated. Uh, in 1992, it was a meeting at uh, uh, Ohio State University where I was one of the four M's, uh, four, four people whose name all started with M. So we called the M4 meeting. This is, uh, uh, Professor Muller, Jerry Mader from uh, MGS, and Bill Melbourne from JPL uh, were there. And uh, we essentially, got the IAG, the International Association for Geodesy, 1994 to form an international GPS service, which is very important and functions today and provides the best quality orbits for uh, GPS. That's 20 years. Why is it 20 years, not 30 years like everything else? The big difference is starting with the Macometer and the TI-4100 industry got in the game. And there was money to be made by making and improving receivers. And there was money to be made by offering services for processing the data. That cut the time scale down to 20 years. LiDAR, who doesn't know what a LiDAR is? Radar is, uh, is uh, radio range and detection. LIDAR is light range and, uh, and detection. That's using a laser. Early in the space uh, uh, endeavor, people realized that you could put uh, uh, LIDAR in space and range it to something on the ground. And if you could measure the round trip and you knew the orbit of, in this case, the space shuttle, you could actually uh, do that for a number of uh, uh, targets on the ground and do geodesy. It's, it's like, like satellite, satellite laser, laser ranging, just backwards. So that was interesting. And uh, in 1986, they proposed the geoscience laser ranging system. That was probably the most ridiculously ambitious thing to be done. Have a satellite with a very precise clock and a very precise laser that sh shoots a very short pulse in two colors. Uh, in fact, they, at some point they did it in three colors, UV, green, and red, to a, 
a large number of targets. So we're talking about thousands of targets, compatory factors on the ground. The idea was it doesn't cost very much money to just go and put a retroreflector on the ground and the satellite can capture them, point the target, point the laser to the target, take the round trip, collect the data, get it to the ground for analysis and go to the next target, bing, 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 bing. Never happened. Too hard to do, much too hard to do, and much too expensive. So in... Uh, uh, three or four years later, they reduced that to just altimetry. We would just simply shoot a laser straight down and measure the round trip and get that as a way of measuring the height of the ground, uh, provided we know the orbit. And at the time, we could get the orbit using satellite laser ranging, and we could just begin to get the orbit by putting a GPS receiver on the spacecraft. This was tried from aircraft uh, by people at Wallops. Uh, Bill Crable at Wallops just flew uh, aircraft. It's an aircraft that I flew to, so T-39. T-39 is the military version of the Sabre liner. The first, so the dual jet, dual engine jet. Uh, and uh, if you have motion sickness, you don't want to be in there as a passenger. Uh, the, the passengers are sitting as a ship. So the, the, the plane goes sideways and you have to look at instruments using something which is like a uh, virtual reality and there's nothing like a bathroom or anything like this. If you get seasick, or you can take your boots out and uh, use that. Uh, but anyway, they started making uh, flights across uh, Greenland and just measuring the height of the, uh, of the ice. And uh, that turned out to be scientifically very important. And they did it also on land. And this is where I participated uh, with my students and postdocs, flying out of Bishop and going over uh, the, uh, 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 the caldera near Mammoth. You know, Mammoth is right here. This is Mono Lake. And I'm going to show you what happened when we just flew from various directions in that location. This was the elevation that could be obtained from uh, the National Geodetic Survey. This is the data we got. Each one of those black things is a little tree. So this, no, we were absolutely jazzed. We could see trees, we could see little rivers, we could see all kinds of things. Nowadays, this, this is done, it's really easy, I mean, uh, cities order that uh, from commercial companies and give you elevation to a small fraction of a foot. Uh, and uh, But at the time, it was great. The only people who could do better at the time were people in Europe, especially in Austria, where they actually used the LiDAR, uh, a laser that had a much higher repeat pulses. This one had a repeat pulse 10 times per second. The Austrians had something that did that several thousand times per second. Uh, and this is where the technology goes today. And this is what, uh, this is a profile on a glacier. This is vastly uh, increased uh, vertical scale, but this here, is a bridge and you can actually see the bridge uh, uh, railings. These are crevasses in the glacier. This was, I cannot remember the date, but you know, this, this was in the very early 1990s. The other thing you could do, and I we're back to the Sierra Nevada, Lake Crowley. We took some flights across Lake Crowley and you can see the noise in the data. And you can see this is where the T-39 had uh, 
a little bit of turbulence. Okay, this is this is where people lose their breakfast. Uh, but that thing has a slope, and that slope is exactly what gets calculated for the what's called the geoid, a line of constant gravity. And that slope is generated by the fact that nearby you have the uh, humongous mass of the Sierra Nevada. So we could actually measure things directly that before we could only measure at certain points and then calculate in between. So 1976 was the shuttle laser concept. 1986, the geoscience laser ranging system, which never made it. Cool Font Workshop, 1988, and in 1990, Geoscience Laser Altimetry System. I went for the launch in 1996 of STS-72, so that's a space shuttle launch, where they actually put one of those systems on the space shuttle and covered all the land between 66 degrees north and 66 degrees south in one week at a, a, a resolution of uh, tens of kilometers. This is the first time that we had a measurement of the altitude of land worldwide, uh, and it was all done in one week. Uh, in 1987, the vegetation canopy LIDAR mission was proposed. They said, aha, if we use LIDAR, some photons over vegetation bounce off the leaves, but some photons go between the leaves all the way to the ground and come back. If we can measure the time between the first photons that come back and the last photons that come back, we can measure the height of the vegetation very interesting. This is done as a matter of fact today, but at the time, ISAT was the first mission launched in 2003 that actually did that from space. Uh, it had terrible problems with the, the lasers uh, having to do with the uh, electronics uh, and there's a whole talk about that. But I said two now, it's the same thing, but it has six uh, laser beams. And those six laser beams allow you not only to measure the elevation of the ground, but also the slope of the ground. So depending on where you start and where you think you are now, uh, between 27 and 42 years. And then, and then, and then, in 1972, we had a big earthquake in the Mojave Desert, Landers earthquake. And a year later, this article appeared in London paper that using a European satellite called ERS-1, Earth Research Satellite 1, and ERS-2 later, you could actually do radar mapping of the ground. And you could do radar mapping before and after the earthquake. And the difference of those two radar maps look something like this. Now, that, that was a big thing. It just hit the earth science community. Uh, you know, just I'm saying, I'm saying it's game changer. Except that what was published here, well, the newspaper just didn't like particularly the, the, the data that was uh, used. So they put a computer simulation. This is a calculation. This is what you ought to see for the earthquake. And here's the earthquake. And this is what you actually saw. Frankly, I think that what you actually saw is number one, pretty on. Number two, much more impressive. Each one of those fringes is a difference of uh, half of the wavelength, half the wavelength, this is a C-band uh, radar. Uh, the wavelength is 56 millimeters. Half of that is about 28 millimeters. It's about an inch. So each one of those fringes 
is a change of one inch of position of the ground between before and after the earthquake in the direction of the sunlight. The big difference with GPS is that these are the GPS stations that we had at the time. Remember this PGGA with the 100 kilometers between sites? This is a map with points separated by about 10 meters. So here we have two systems, one system that gives you solutions every day, but a point every 100 kilometers, and one solution that gives you a, a, a solution every 10 meters, but not very often. So what do we do? Well, we proposed, and I was a PI on this, a, a mission called ECHO that would measure 10% of the surface of the earth, they measure everything that's tectonic, everything that's ice, and measure it every few days, maybe eight days, and uh, make the data available to the rest of the world. And we could analyze those data. 10 minutes of data per orbit, a few hundred terabytes per for the whole mission. That got top reviews, and it got uh, nixed, mostly, we think, by the Department of Defense. Uh, what we wanted to do is use L-band. L-band has a wavelength of 21 centimeters, about this much. Uh, to think that uh, it's C-band is much smaller, you can get much pre better precision, but L-band, it can ignore vegetation. You can see the ground between the trees. So that's what we were particularly interested in. We proposed that in 1994, again, 1996, in collaboration with the French. There was a proposal by Ball Aerospace where they hired the, the same science team and secured DOD uh, uh, funding, uh, but that didn't fly. We did ECHO-3 in 2001 with NSF uh, uh, support as well as NASA support. In 2007, there was a study by the National Research Council called DESTINY. It's got a complicated name, but uh, didn't fly. In 2024, January 2024, emission will fly. The instrument is built. It's a joint effort between NASA and India on an Indian spacecraft. And it will cover the entire world, not 10% of the world, the whole world every eight days. And all the data will end up in the cloud. So everybody can get the data and all the software will be open source. Uh, so if we take CSAT, which is 1978 uh, experimental mission, that's 44 years. If we take ECHO, that's about 30 years from initial concept to revamped. So what's the science? The San Andreas fault experiment was proposed in 1975 by NASA. Dave Smith at NASA testified at a committee on the Aeronautical and Space Sciences of the United States Senate. The chair was Senator Moss. The meeting was in uh, Salt Lake City. And uh, Chairman Moss says, by being able to make measurements of movement, you can make observations for as to where earthquakes activity might occur. Isn't that true? And Dave Smith, that's right. On a broad scale, we can actually figure out where earthquakes are going to happen, not quite tell you when they will happen. Well, actually, he was right to hedge on that. But even that, that was pretty ambitious. So they're going to try. All right, here we go. They started 
an experiment between Quincy, California, and Ote Mesa, Southern California, and they moved that to Monument Peak, which is very close, <coughs> and made a few measurements, laser results, and showed that, according to them, uh, the distance between Quincy and Monument Peak shortened by eight centimeters per year. That was also something that caused a lot of consternation and a lot of eyeballs raised because the geological average was 5.5 centimeters a year. We knew that from plate tectonics. So do we believe that? <laughs> a lot of geologists just didn't believe that you know, it's not very useful. But using VLBI, the distance between Haystack in Massachusetts and Owens Valley, we're pretty close to Quincy, showed zero. Well, that turned out to be wrong, but uh, zero was what we expected. Now we know that it should be a little bit more than that because the basin and range between Salt Lake City and California is actually expanding. Not fast, not fast at all. Anyway, SAFE continued and uh, they started getting solutions where they mixed and matched data from the various technologies. And this is what it looked like. The way that, no, this is the original, eight centimeters per year, well, not true, nobody believed it. But now with a lot more data, we can get something like 25, 29 millimeters per year. It's 13 hours. Well, with GPS now, we can actually get those solutions. We get those solutions all the time. These are daily solutions, but now we get the solutions uh, in very, very short order. Uh, and now, do you believe that red line and the data? These are daily solutions by from 1995 approximately and 2020. And the rate of uh, shortening is about 27 millimeters per year with the length of all those blue things are one sigma error bars. So now we can say, ah, new science. You get those things where you get the periods of time where the slope is very constant and then you get something that has a signal in there maybe. That signal may be of interest to people who want to look at earthquakes, for instance, or look at other things. Uh, and this is where we are getting. So all that stuff, except for this last slide, takes place in the 20th century. And all that stuff, as far as I can tell, shows that there's a natural time scale for all those technologies. And I suggest that these time scales is one gigasecond, which I call one gen. That's 10 kilo days, 30 years. The duration of no, our country has been in place for 8.9 gens. The space, uh, era is about two and a third gens. A five-year PhD is 183 milligens. A workshop of five days is 250 microgens. It makes sense, right? So we could use gens. A three-year mission is 109 milligens, a Landsat, ah, oh, Landsat. That's at seven, you know, it's been in the sky for a long, long time, but 30 years. One gen. Sunlight laser ranging, one gen. Geodetic VLBI, one gen to uh, establish. Geodetic GPS, remember, it was 20 years, ah, two thirds of a gen. Ranging from space, uh, between 0.8 and one and a third gens. El Bensar, same thing. So, what do we do? 
what about this all this planning over a period of 10 years, which we started from, which is 0 0.3 genes? Well, I'm taking a little bit out of context, admittedly, some comments from a National Academy report. How do you achieve progress and make plans and make the right kind of plans when things take one generation? Remember, the, the, uh, the lead poisoning in the tobacco was about one generation also. Well, you have to commit to sustain science and applications and you have to continue being very ambitious. If you don't reach some of your goals, then that means you were not ambitious enough. If you have to plan on 10 years, let's say 0.3 gens, sure, do that. But keep dreaming and keep thinking one generation ahead. Pursue increasingly ambitious objectives and innovative solutions that enhance and accelerate the science and the value of space-based observations and analysis to initiate to the world in a way that delivers great value even when resources are constrained and the issues that, that re, uh, ensures that further investment will pay substantial dividends. And I would add and make sure that the data don't get buried in some data center that does not deliver the data to researchers, insist on full and open data. And that's me. Thank you very much. Wow, Jean-Bernard, that was really, really interesting. Um, you had us all enthralled. We're going to go ahead and open this up to members for um, questions. Um, you're welcome to just speak up or raise your hand electronically, however you please. I'll throw out um, with our concern about climate change, if it basically takes one gen to, uh, you okay. know, minimum to get any sort of change or, or program launched, do we really have a hope of being able to find and implement solutions uh, in enough time to, to really save our planet? That's a good question, uh, Susan. Uh the global warming I and mean, climate change, uh, climate change has been known for a long, long time. It's, you know, it's been computed, uh, the effect of uh, uh, the CO2 has been computed since the beginning of the late of 19th century, in the early part of the 20th century. But global warming was uh, introduced by Jim Hansen at uh, a hearing uh, on Capitol Hill in 1988, I think. Well, we now have it as a major political issue. Everybody's talking about it. Everybody's uh, trying to make uh, laws about uh, using less fossil fuels and so on. So that's one gen. That's what it takes. Okay. Questions from other members? I, I can make a prediction. One of the Please. things that one of the things that uh, is becoming uh, more and more important is ultra fine atmospheric pollution. And these these are uh, small particles, about the size of cigarette smoke particles. And they get generated by industry, by freeways, from tires on the ground, and so on and so forth. A lot of that stuff is also soot from diesel. That, I guarantee you, is going to become a big political issue. And we are close to one gen on, uh, on that matter. And uh, there's going to be regulations uh, very tight regulations, uh, cutting uh, suit emissions for all kinds of industrial uh, activities and driving. Uh, diesel trucks, diesel engines on ships, 
are a major issue. It's a health issue. One gen. And your projection on being able to better predict uh, earthquakes? Ah, well, no, that, that's been charged. <laughs> Do you know what uh, Charles Richter of the Richter scale fame yes. said? Anybody who claims that they can't predict earthquakes is either a liar or a charlatan. Ah. <laughs> no, we're not there. One of these days. And the risk of our satellite infrastructure, since that satellite infrastructure is so critical to all of this research, um, is there uh, an international consensus about not attacking one another's satellites? <laughs> well, that depends what the satellites do. I I, uh, I mean, should there be a, a very major conflict uh with with all out war globally uh i wouldn't uh, stay close to communication satellite no this could be these are going to be targets um i i think uh no negotiating uh, a a weapons free space and space activity similar to uh, Antarctica is something that we should do. We should negotiate that and we should enforce it. Message from Stephen Adler. Can you tell us what you're working on now? Oh, <laughs> I'm actually uh, looking at LiDAR data uh, for a, the city of Encinitas to try and understand what's going to happen to the local hydrology if the plans to build 30 houses, including density bonus, right next to my house would be like that. That's changing the impervious surface of 6.5 acres from 15% to 65%. No, so what happens to the water? And uh, that's that's what I'm doing now. All right. Well, we want to thank you very, very much for this really interesting presentation. It was very enlightening. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.